So today's lecture is about uh, the interaction of radiation to biological organisms, part three, ionizing radiation. So we've done last week non-ionizing radiation and follow up to the general principles of how electromagnetic radiation interacts with biological organisms. Today we'll be focusing on ionizing radiation, which is a fairly well-established area in uh, biology, uh, especially with medical imaging, radiobiology, and radiation oncology. We won't talk so much about uh, uh, radiation effects relating to, for example, uh, Hiroshima or nuclear weapons and that sort of thing. We're focusing a little bit more on the medical applications of ionizing radiation. Uh, that being said, some of the general principles we'll be talking about are how ionizing radiation interacts with biological uh, cells and tissues will be similar for both. So the question for today was, give an example of using ionizing radiation in medical diagnosis or therapy. I had specifically said that uh, we don't have to do that question because I wanted you to focus on uh, choosing the papers for the final project. And as mentioned, I've received that from many of you, and uh, I will uh, do individual feedback by email uh, on your selections. But in general, those were very good. So we'll do a very quick review from the last lecture of non-ionizing radiation. For example, electroconvulsive therapy or ECT, uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation, TMS, uh, tumor treating fields, transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation, or TENS, and electroporation-based transfer of drugs, electrochemotherapy. Uh, I know some of you have actually chosen papers related to these areas, so that's very good. Uh, in general, uh, neuromodulation, it can be used for a number of psychiatric disorders. And these can be direct methods, such as deep brain stimulation, but also the indirect methods using electromagnetic energy delivered such as magnetic seizure therapy, transcranial direct current stimulation, or ECT, which we'll talk about shortly, uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation, which is a, uh, uses Faraday's law of induction to create those electrical currents in uh, the brain, and vagus nerve stimulation, which is another direct method. So in electroconvulsive therapy, the idea is to uh, deliver a direct current to induce a mild seizure. A seizure is a sustained, uh, uncoordinated, large-scale electrical activity in the brain. And that has been shown to disrupt severe depression for some people, particularly older people, with depression that is not responsive to pharmacotherapy or drugs. And one of the ideas is that this mild seizure may induce or allow some neural rewiring and might boost neurogenesis. Neurogenesis is the process, as you know, of forming new nerve cells. And this is a, a procedure done under general anesthesia. So you need to have general monitoring, such as in the ECG or EKG for the heart. You need to have an oximeter for blood oxygen levels and he, hemoglobin saturation. You need to measure blood pressure you should measure also the muscle activity related to the seizure. Uh, and then, of course, an EEG uh, recording to monitor that uh, mild seizure that has been generated. And we've talked about all of these, uh, or we will talk about these modalities in more detail, uh, ECG, EEG, and so forth, in the actual next lecture. Transcranial magnetic stimulation is a way of inducing these electric currents in uh, the brain indirectly by the Faraday principle of magnetic induction. In the magnetic induction, you know that a changing magnetic field will uh, flux will create an induced current. Uh, so you have a magnetic coil here. It is, uh, the magnetic flux is changing. So there'll be an induced current. And those induced currents are those ions that are around the membrane uh, around of, of cells, these potassium and the sodium, the chloride, and other ions, uh, calcium in particular, and those will be moving uh, uh, in these tissue spaces to create a current. So this rapidly fluxing or changing flux of magnetic field induces a current in the underlying cortex, uh, 
it's also important to note that the brain has its brain cells or what's called the gray matter on the surface of the brain. So that's near the surface that makes this procedure more possible. If the brain cells were much deeper in the brain, then the induced currents might be uh, substantially less because of the distance from the changing magnetic field. It is, of course, non-invasive. And one of the other advantages of transcranial magnetic stimulation as compared to the direct current ECT is it permits a more focal manipulation of the cortical activity just below this magnetic coil. So this is magnetic seizure therapy. So you a uh, similar concept. It's high intensity to target antidepressant regions. It has fewer side effects than ECT, but just like ECT with the direct current to require anesthesia, uh, it, it causes a generalized seizure, also known as a tonic-clonic seizure. And of course, you need to monitor the electroencephalogram, the EEG, and the vitals. We talked about tumor treating fields with low frequencies of uh, radio frequencies, very low frequencies of electromagnetic radiation with uh, some effect on melanoma, glioma, and other cancers. This is still a area in development, uh, but it is uh, something that is under active research. And some of you may have actually chosen papers in these fields. Uh, and finally, in this area, we talked, for example, about uh, transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation, or TENS. It's a low frequency electrical current applied to the skin, uh, aiming at the nerves underneath the skin to stimulate them. And the TENS can vary by the waveform, can vary with the frequency, can vary with the pulse width or duration, and of course, vary with the amplitude or intensity. Uh, there are a number of theories why this electrical stimulation on the surface can decrease pain. One of them is the gate control theory. The other one is the opioid mediated control theory, central basing theory, and another one is related to local vasodilatation, uh, expansion of the blood vessels in the skin uh, that allow uh, toxins and so forth that are causing pain and other uh, molecules that are causing pains, prostaglandins and so forth, to be cleared out. The leading theory is this gate control theory. Uh, and that concept is that you have two types of uh, receptors, two types of pain receptors and the long lasting dull pain that is typical of chronic pain is uh, gated or distracted by stimulating other pain receptors that are not with the same level of pain. And so that cross talk and distraction minimizes the overall pain felt by the patient. Uh, finally, we have electrochemotherapy where you use electrical fields to disrupt the membrane slightly, uh, enhanced mem membrane permeability to allow a drug to enter into those cells. Uh, and you use that electric pulse generation in combination with drug therapy to bring a drug in, into tumor cells, uh, increasing their effect and potentially decreasing the bad side effects to normal tissues. So that's a review of non-ionizing radiation. We did that very quickly, just to uh, review the high points. Now we're going to talk uh, about ionizing radiation. And uh, we have two areas that we'll discuss with ionizing radiation. As I mentioned, we're not going to talk so much about uh, Hiroshima and uh, other uh, Chernobyl or other uh, nuclear accidents or radiation accidents. We're going to focus in this lecture more on the medical side of things with medical imaging, number one, and also medical treatment or specifically radiobiology and radiation oncology. So now we focus on medical imaging. So this is a historical timeline of radiology. Uh, over the last uh, 120 years or so, there have been a number of modalities. Modality is a me method of imaging the body in medical imaging. And uh, the main four modalities are x-rays and CT. X-rays were discovered around 1900. Another important modality is ultrasound. It was discovered around the 1960s. Another one is MRI, 
or magnetic resonance imaging discovered around the mid 1980s uh, and PET scanning positron emission tomography discovered around the late 1950s to early 1960s. These four modalities are the major modalities in medical imaging today. And there have been essentially no new modalities since 1985. So you see a lot of incremental improvements that we'll talk about. For example, CT uh, is actually a form of X-rays. It's computed tomography. It's a form of X-ray in which computations are done to create tomograms or slices, not just a two-dimensional image, but uh, you combine those tomograms to create a three-dimensional uh, representation of what's being imaged. Then combination of PET-CT, multi-slice CT, MSCT, uh, other types of MRI are all additional improvements of these existing four modalities. One of the themes of today's lecture will be that we need new modalities to improve the diagnosis in biomedicine. And um, I will be explaining the reasons for this, not just the fact that these are old modalities, but I'll be explaining the fundamental reasons why uh, we need some new approaches to medical imaging. And the whole electromagnetic spectrum offers many possibilities. X-rays we talked about, uh, MRI is based on uh, radio waves, and we'll talk about how that works. And PET is based on gamma rays. Ultrasound, of course, is not electromagnetic, it's based on sound waves. So that's not the entire electromagnetic spectrum. So this is a timeline of X-ray technology. So we're gonna focus on X-rays. X-rays, as you know, are ionizing radiation. It was discovered by Wilhelm Röntgen in 1895. Uh, in 1829 was the first cardiac catheterization. Catheterization refers to putting a catheter or wire a tube, very small tube into the blood vessels and going into the heart. In 1958, the first coronary angiogram was performed, where you actually can look uh, inside at the coronary arteries, the blood vessels in the heart, uh, not just from the outside, but you can see them in the inside. And I'm going to explain why that is uh, necessary. You might say, well, we do x-rays, we do a chest x-ray from the outside, why do we need to do an angiogram? Why do we have to do all these special techniques? And I will explain that reason as well. And then of course, in the early 1970s, CT was invented by Houtsfield. CT is computed tomography. It is a, exactly the same technology. It's X-ray technology, but it's combining multiple images that are uh, going around the patient, multiple images, and computing them. So it is not a new form of X-ray. It's not really a new form of electromagnetic radiation. It's the combination of computers and algorithms to uh, multiple X-ray images. Then uh, you can have multi-slice CT. So you're basically taking many images, two slices at once, and 64 slice CT and the dual source CT, which is actually two types of X-rays. So that is a improvement in terms of the fundamental radiation. So that's an overall timeline of X-ray technology. So how are X-rays produced? So this is a little bit of physics, some of you may be familiar with, but uh, X-rays are produced by the deceleration of electrons. So an electron is going very fast, an electron one half mv squared, approximately, obviously they're relativistic effects, but the kinetic energy is related to the velocity, square of the velocity and the mass, uh, multiplied by the mass, one half mv squared. So that has a lot of energy going very fast. And if the electron is slowed down, then of course the energy, the kinetic energy is less. That energy has to be given off. Uh, if a car is going very fast and it crashes into a wall, uh, 
So the kinetic energy gets converted into uh, an explosion, into a sound energy, and uh, maybe a fire and some heat. So there's conversion of the energy into other energy. And in the case of a car, uh, much of that will be some kinetic energy of explosion uh, and also the energy related to sound, which is also kinetic energy of uh, air molecules. Uh, any questions? Okay, so uh, that's a car that's slowing down or decelerating, uh, Kamsok. Uh, if you have an electron decelerating, that change in kinetic energy will also release energy. And it turns out that that amount of energy will be released in the form of x-rays. Not sound, of course, not uh, heat, uh, but x-rays. And we call that Bremsstrahlung x-rays. So the uh, electron is decelerating and uh, against a certain uh, barrier, which is composed of atoms, and it will release energy in a distribution in this way, the X-ray intensity. Uh, if these are the energies, it will have a, a peak and then some sort of uh, limit, which we related to the initial kinetic energy of the electrons. So this deceleration occurs against atoms. So if we look at this in more detail, we have what's called X-ray spec spectrum. So you have approximately a black body of the Bremsstrahlen with the maximum photon energy related to the maximum kinetic energy of the electrons. Uh, so if there's a sharp, it's not exactly a, a black body because there's a, this sharp uh, cutoff here and the relative intensity but you also get characteristic radiation with higher intensity. And that's related to the fact that uh, when you hit those atoms that are slowing down the electrons, they will have energy levels. So they will uh, produce especially greater amounts of energy, in, in other words, amplitude or intensity at those specific frequencies. So they'll be very sharp frequencies. So the X-ray, a spectra from these decelerated electrons related to Bremsstrahlen, uh, which is this uh, general reduction in the kinetic energies, and then the characteristic radiation that we see here. So how do we produce the X-rays in practical terms? Uh, we heat a filament. That filament will be releasing electrons. Uh, there'll be a voltage uh, across here, a very high potential difference across here. Uh, the target will be tungsten atoms. That's the common element used in medical x-rays. And those electron beam will suddenly be stopping against the tungsten and x-rays will be emitted. Bremsstrahlen and characteristic x-rays. So, uh, and then, uh, this one other interesting aspect is because of these electrons hitting the tungsten, this spot will be heating up considerably. So typically the anode, which has uh, where the electrons are hitting will be rotating. So we have what's called a rotating copper anode with a metal target a tungsten. There's also a coolant, perhaps a water uh, circulating inside that anode uh, and it's rotating to dissipate the heat. So that is the basic practical production of x-rays and the physics behind x-ray production in a medical sense. It's a deceleration of electrons, Bremsstrahlen, and the characteristic radiation or specific high peaks of intensity related to the nature of the target. So the first generation of x-rays we call x-ray radiography. Uh, for example, mammography is one application to uh, image the breast, chest x-rays, dental x-rays. Uh, these basic x-rays have been uh, used for over 100 years, and fairly well-established first generation use in medicine. So how do x-rays see into the body? We talked about physics, now let's talk a little bit about biology. 
So most biological tissues are composed, as we know from organic chemistry, of carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and hydrogen. So basically second row elements and hydrogen. These second row elements are quite light atoms. Light meaning kabiowoyo, it's not uh, heavy. And uh, they don't have a lot of neutrons and protons and they don't have a lot of electrons. And uh, they are fairly large and the electrons are fairly far away from the nucleus, even with these uh, non-metals here. And so the energy levels are uh, fairly big. Uh, I shouldn't say that. The, the energy levels are fairly small, excuse me, so that the energies given off are, are not very great. Uh, if we want to have higher energy levels, we have to have electrons more tightly connected to bigger atoms. And those inner electrons, more inner electrons, more tightly connected to the uh, nucleus will have electronic transitions. You remember lecture number two, very early on in the course, those electronic transitions, which will be much greater and they correspond to X-rays. So these second row elements and certainly hydrogen are almost transparent to X-rays. The X-rays, they're not a lot of tightly bound inner electrons in these biological tissues. There are two major exceptions. Uh, I think a couple people came new, so please enter your name into the chat room if you've uh, joined uh, recently. So there are two exceptions. One of them is calcium. So you can see calcium is a fourth row element. So it has more protons and it's going to be more inner electrons tightly bound. These calciums have more, uh, calcium is associated with bone and iron is associated with blood. So bone tissue uh, will absorb more x-rays and tissue that has lots of blood which is the iron, Fe, will also absorb more x-rays. So when you're seeing an x-ray, you'll be seeing mostly uh, the absorption by bone and the other tissues that you see some absorption is mostly related to the iron in the blood in those tissues. There's also iron in the mitochondria. Uh, so muscle tends to absorb a little more x-rays than, for example, fat and certainly more than air. So this is a chest radiograph. The source of the x-rays is from behind. So we call that a posterior anterior radiograph. Person is supposed to uh, put their shoulders against the uh, x-ray machine. And we call that a PA or posterior anterior chest x-ray or CXR. So this is the chest x-ray. And you can see that the bones with the white are absorbing the x-ray and the heart has a lot of blood that's absorbing the x-rays. The spinal column, the vertebral column has bone and also big, large blood vessels. So that will be quite absorbing of x-rays. You'll see that the air in the lungs absorb relatively little x-rays. So they're transmitting more. And there's actually an air pocket in the stomach here <clears throat> on the left side. And that also uh, absorbs very little x-rays. <laughs> so it's the calcium and the iron in the body that's absorbing the x-rays. So how do we interpret the chest x-ray? This is basically the contrast between absorbing uh, atoms and non-absorbing atoms. But some of the principles of reading a chest x-ray for, from a doctor's perspective, a radiologist's perspective, perspective, very important to read the x-rays yourself, not just the report, to be systematic, to be aware of common artifacts, to compare over time. Uh, the doctor will always be looking at the previous x-rays uh, because each x-ray is slightly different. Uh, patient might be positioned slightly different. The 
uh, amount of x-ray, the exposure might be different depending on you know, which hospital they went to. But if we can compare them over time, uh, that can even out these uh, discrepancies. Important to observe symmetry and believe that you've missed uh, findings. So always be skeptical. So systematic approach that we mentioned to check the identifying information, make sure it's the right patient, to evaluate the technique. Are they rotated? Is the amount of radiation uh, normal? Uh, is it underpenetrated, overpenetrated? Uh, examine the soft tissues, bones, look at equipment, evaluate other structures, and typically to look at the lung pathology last. And this is interesting from a professional's perspective, uh, is to start with the least significant uh, last. So, in other words, the things that look obvious, you should put aside and look at the things that are more subtle in the beginning. That is a professional systematic approach to a chest x-ray. This is a typical anatomy of a chest x-ray. You have the trachea, which is uh, entering the lungs. You have uh, the ribs. You have the pulmonary arteries going out to the vessels. You can see there's lots of blood in there. You have the uh, pulmonary artery uh, here towards the left side. You see the heart, of course, the left ventricle. You see the diaphragm. It's a muscle that helps in breathing. You see the liver. The liver is very dense with blood, so it's typically very white here. You see the uh, stomach, and there may be a stomach air bubble here. Uh, and of course, you have other bones, such as the clavicle, the scap uh, scapula, uh, and the ribs as mentioned. So here's a question related to kind of the systematic approach. The question is, what's wrong with the lung tissue? Well, actually, nothing's really wrong with the lung tissue. We actually have a fracture uh, in the clavicle here. So that's uh, easy to miss because people often focus x-rays, chest x-rays on the lung tissue. Uh, some clinical conditions can be picked up. One of them is consolidation. Consolidation is when the lung here gets filled with bacteria or with a tumor or with blood. And of course, compared to air, where x-rays are not absorbed, all this blood or cells with the iron in it, as we mentioned, will absorb uh, the x-rays and will appear with what's called consolidation. Uh, this consolidation can also calcify. So calcium uh, absorbs some radiation. Another example of pathology is what's called a pleural effusion. Pleural effusion is fluid around the lung. So the fluid being denser uh, and depends on the type of fluid, especially if it's blood, will have more absorption of x-rays and of course will be a contrast between the air in the lungs and the, the fluid that's around the lungs. And we call this a pleural effusion. We've been talking about, everyone knows about COVID-19. COVID-19 leads in severe cases to what's called adult respiratory distress syndrome or ARDS. You don't have to be a specialist to see that these lungs here uh, have a lot of fluid related to them, a lot of uh, other stuff other than the normal air that should be there, which absorbs very little x-rays. This fluid, these cells, uh, this uh, increased density will absorb more x-rays and appear with this pattern. Uh, the, the heart is normal, so it's not related to heart failure. You have this whiting effect diffusely, and you don't see any fluid here, no pleural effusion. So this is uh, very much adult respiratory distress syndrome and appears in the left upper lobe of the lung. There might be some even greater uh, activity. That might be the original focus of the pneumonia. So as mentioned, uh, calcium with bone and calcifications and iron with blood uh, are related to the absorption in biological tissues. Now, of course, we may wanna see more things. Just looking at the bones and the amount of blood and maybe some fluid is, doesn't show you a lot 
So we want to use, and this is a very common thing in radiology, we want to use some form of contrast, some way of enhancing that difference between the tissues. Because if you look back here, Uh, you see uh, this patchiness, but you don't really know what that patchiness is. Are there ways to increase the contrast that we can maybe learn more information about uh, the underlying biology? Well, one way we do that is with what are called contrast agents. Contrast agents are heavy atoms. Again, heavy atoms absorb x-rays. And there are two types of contrast agents. One that is in the gastrointestinal tract that we can swallow. So it will show more contrast in the intestines. The other is iodine, which we inject intravenously and we can see more details of the blood vessels. Uh, and this is the example we saw of the coronary angiogram, which we'll see. So as you can see, uh, observe these atoms are heavy atoms. Iodine is a fifth row, one, two, three, four, five, fifth row element. Barium is a sixth row element and they have a considerable number of protons and neutrons. Those protons are attracting many inner electrons with very tight high energies and so those will absorb x-rays. This is a barium enema and this enema in this case the barium is injected up into the large intestine uh, with the barium contrast to look at colon cancer. So you can see this is the colon and you can see that this colon with the large intestine uh, has some strange uh, configuration. This is the normal colon, normal colon, and suddenly it's very small and doesn't seem to have the same pattern. This is an example of colon cancer. So we see this contrast. It doesn't go there and say, okay, this is cancer. We have to uh, infer that. So for example, if you go uh, to the airport and you check your bag and they have an x-ray machine and inside the x-ray machine, you have your, a gun or a knife, they will see that. Uh, not because there's a label and says there's a gun or a knife, but we see the uh, contrast, we see the patterns, uh, and the pattern looks like uh, a gun. There's nothing that's telling you. It's not a signal specifically from a gun. We look at it from the pattern, uh, and that's why it's called imaging. So this pattern suggests that it's a cancer. We don't know if it's a cancer, because actually cancer, of course, needs a pathologic or tissue diagnosis. This is an example of an angiogram. An angiogram is you inject the iodine into the bloodstream and it goes around the bloodstream and you can uh, visualize because of the very intense absorption by the uh, iodine in the bloodstream, not going to the rest of the tissues, eventually it goes out through the kidneys. You can see great detail of the blood vessels. This is what we call a cerebral or brain angiogram with iodine content contrast. So in this case, we see also an anomaly, strange uh, shape here, and this is what we call a brain aneurysm or an outpouching of the blood vessel in the brain that can also cause disease. So this one is colon cancer, this one is a brain aneurysm. So this uh, angiography is a combination of x-ray and intravascular contrast, and this is what we would call a contrast filling defect. Uh, and that represents a blockage. This is a coronary artery, and that blockage uh, relates to atherosclerosis, can lead to a heart attack, and uh, angiography is very important for seeing how open uh, the blood vessels are. Now let's move to the second generation of CT. The second generation is a basic idea of taking x-ray readings or x-ray pictures at many different angles around the object and then using a computer to reconstruct uh, all these different pictures. So it's like a chest x-ray. We saw a single x-ray, but doing many of them. 
and we call these uh, multiple images that are recomposed uh, slices or tomograms. So what are the components of computerized uh, tomography? One of them is the, there are four components, the gantry, which we'll discuss shortly. That is the uh, circular housing, whereby the x-ray images are taken by going step-by-step step around the patient. There's the x-ray tube, which produces the x-ray by Bremsstrahlung radiation, the deceleration of electrons. There are the detectors, and then there's the control console. So the gantry has uh, the x-ray tube, the high voltage generator, the detector array, data acquisition, and the uh, slip ring where you go in and out. Uh, so the gantry includes these components. It's this uh, outside here. So the CT x-ray tube is uh, uh, anode. The heat capacity is very important, so it generates a lot of heat. Detector elements or multiple detectors around this gantry, and that gantry is uh, rotating inside, and of course a control cam console and uh, computer to reconstruct the tomographs. So the basic concept, uh, there's an uh, axial scanning method, we call it, uh, that's one reason why it's called CAT scan, computerized axial tomography, and so CAT, and sometimes abbreviated CT, a computerized tomography. So the x-ray tube and the detector rotate around in 360 degrees. So this is the x-ray tube, this is the detector, and it goes around the patient 360 degrees. Multi-slice CT will have multiple detectors and multiple tubes going, uh, so you can create an image much faster. Uh, the patient's table is stationary, and the gantry goes, uh, and this goes around one circle. Then that's one cross-sectional image that will create one slice, because all 360 degrees, that's reconstructed, as we'll see shortly. And then the patient moves uh, one step to the next position, process begins again, create another image. Uh, to recreate this image, we do what's called a radon transform. We had talked about Fourier transform, uh, which is a conversion from one type of signal to another type of signal. Uh, and the radon transform is a mathematical way of going from individual pictures to a three-dimensional uh, slice. So this is an example of the CT as we see. This is the gantry. Inside the gantry is the x-ray source or anode and detector. And this is the uh, slip tube that the patient's bed will go uh, through. And this is an example of the successive slices or tomograms of a head CT going from the very bottom of the brain here all the way to the top of the skull here. Uh, we can combine angiography and CT scan. So imagine if you inject a contrast into the intervascular, into the bloodstream, and then do a CT quickly through that, then you can see the tomograms of the uh, blood vessels. And that's an example here of a coronary CT angiography. You can see here the uh, coronary arteries and it doesn't look like any filling defects. There might be a filling defect here, but in general this looks fairly open. So another modality that uses radiation a little bit differently of course is positron emission tomography. Similar concept of a tomogram where you have uh, detectors all around, but instead of a source coming from the outside of x-rays, you have actually gamma rays coming from inside the body and hitting those detectors. Those gamma rays are very high energy uh, and the body doesn't normally produce these gamma rays. So how do you produce gamma rays from the body? Well, you inject with a radionuclide that's sending out gamma rays. That radionuclide might be connected to a glucose molecule, 
or another molecule that will be concentrated in specific areas of the body. And therefore, you can make a tomogram of the, X, of the gamma rays coming out. So it's the opposite of X-rays coming in. It's gamma rays coming out. And you can take a picture of the pattern of those gamma rays, use the radon transform to convert that into slices, uh, combine those individual pictures, uh, and get an image. So this is uh, the PET scanner. Uh, and this is a uh, PET. You can, this is compared to MRI. And you inject those radionuclides in a normal patient, you might see more glucose being in the brain. The brain is more active. In Alzheimer's disease, which is dementia, brain is less active, you'll see less of the gamma radiation coming out. In fact, you'll see in the uh, parietal lobes, especially less, and the frontal lobes less. So how does magnetic resonance imaging work? So the basic physics is the patient is placed in the magnet tunnel, similar concept of different 360 degree uh, detectors. The radio waves pass through the body in pulses and those radio waves will stimulate protons in water, protons are throughout the body, to uh, emit radiation also in radio waves. And so this is very low energy. X-rays and gamma rays are very high energy. MRI is very low energy. So this, this chapter is about ionizing, not chapter, this lecture is about ionizing radiation. Magnetic resonance imaging has nothing to do with ionizing radiation, but I, I include it here just for completeness. It's actually radio waves. But this idea is the similar, is that uh, the brain or the body releases this radio waves in a pattern related to the structure. Now, again, just like in the PET scan, the body is not naturally emitting gamma rays. The body is not naturally emitting um, radio waves. Uh, we have to stimulate it, probe it, pump it to emit those radio waves. And so, Magnetic resonance imaging involves a high power magnet to create the spin differences, in other words, energy levels. It requires a pulse of <coughs> radio waves to then excite those protons, and then those protons will release energy uh, in the form of radio waves, which then make a pattern. So you have two types of relaxation times, uh, T1 and T2, and they look differently. This is the hip joint. This is uh, uh, a mass. Uh, this is a bone here uh, and some sort of mass here. So high signal is very bright. You see fat, bone on T1, tumors, solid masses, uh, cysts. So you can see this bright T2 uh, corresponds to some sort of cyst or tumor. Low signal is dark. Uh, is also this pattern. You don't need to memorize or, or learn these, but just to know that there are different patterns of uh, high and low signal on T1 and T2 images in MRI that correspond to different types of tissue. So it's not related to heavy atoms like x-rays, but it's related to certain tissue characteristics. So again, this is non-ionizing. You have a magnet you have a very strong magnet that creates uh, uh, these differences. You have a radio excitation coil that will create uh, the protons to spin to a higher energy. They will relax to a lower energy. And you have a receiving coil uh, that will receive that radio energy. So the patient is placed in the magnetic field as described. The radio frequency excitation, radio frequency signal detection, and the image reconstruction from the radon transform that we described. So here are the protons. Uh, they become aligned with the magnetization. The uh, radio frequency energy comes in. Those protons get moved to a higher energy level. They will relax and release energy. <laughs> now we use a uh, radon transform to convert the images, but we use a Fourier transform uh, 
to convert those frequencies uh, to uh, individual or to take out the individual frequencies. So when you do a, a pulse of radiation coming in, the radio frequency radiation, that's a wide range of frequencies. It's a uh, broad function, if you will. It will give off many different frequencies. So the resulting uh, image will have not just in space, but will have different frequencies of radiation. And how do we pick out those different frequencies? Well, they're the sum of individual waves. And that, of course, is a Fourier transform. A Fourier transform is a function that's a sum of constituent waves. And each of those waves will correspond to different, free, different types of protons in the body. So how do we do tissue contrast and MRI? Tissue contrast with uh, uh, x-rays was related to the heavy atoms, but tissue contrast with MRI is going to be related to density of mobile protons, T1 characteristic, T2 characteristics, mobile protein protons, the ones that are really moving around usually mean fat and water. Um, solid materials like proteins or bone have very few or no mobile uh, protons. Uh, T1 characteristics are related to the ability of the protons to exchange energy with the environment. T2 is uh, protons that are exchanging energy with relation to each other in local magnetic fields. So here's some tissue contrast uh, with uh, MRI and T1. This is uh, the vertebral column. This is the spinal cord. Uh, this is the back of the vertebral column. This is a uh, fat, subcutaneous fat. So you can tell different tissues here based on this tissue contrast in T1. So T1 images can be roughly thought of as a map of proton energy within the fatty tissues in the body. So fat typically comes up in T1 uh, weighted. Uh, liquids typically don't have uh, have fat. They don't have any fat generally, especially cerebrospinal fluid. So these are generally dark or black on T1. On the T2 side, this is basically images of proton energy within fat and water based. So fat will be very bright as well as water. Uh, and the bone cortex which is uh, uh, around here, it gives off no signal because it contains no free protons. So we can use these MRI to look at spine pathology, for example. Uh, so abnormal uh, low signal on T1 images, particularly uh, some pathological process like trauma, infection, or cancer. So you can see a low signal on T1 a low signal on T2 or a high signal on T2 typically indicates some pathologic process. So you compare these, you see some pattern, and that gives a hint that there's some uh, anomaly there. In this case, the patient has multiple myeloma. Now, it's very interesting to note that these images are not really related to the biology, the underlying biology. These are physical images. They're physical images of proton energies. And in the case of x-ray, they're physical images of inner electron density. Uh, and these two concepts, protons and inner electrons, are not biological concepts. They are physical chemical concepts. And so one of the reasons I said at the beginning of this lecture that medical imaging needs new modalities is we need new modalities that relate to the fundamental biology. Uh, so that's an important question to keep in mind. We're not going to answer that directly today, but keep that in mind. How can we image, not just sort of the physics, but how can we image the biology? Uh, and, and of course we have microscopy, looking in a microscope uh, and seeing things move around. Uh, we can see the proteins, uh, well, we don't see the proteins, but we see the cells. Uh, are there techniques to 
image things directly, not indirectly through protons or inner electrons, but directly. So think about that and we'll uh, address that issue in a later lecture. But as I mentioned here, it is quite indirect how we figure out if there's a problem uh, with that tissue. So this tells us here that there is some issue with this bone here. And the patient had multiple myeloma. The MRI images will not show that. That will only be possible with some sort of biopsy. So how do we compare CT with MRI? CT, as we know, is related to um, uh, inner electrons. They are absorbed by calcium and iron. Uh, MRI is related to proton spins, and you particularly have relaxation or energy given off by mobile or moving protons, uh, which are typically in fat and fluids. So you'll see uh, head CT, this is the skull, has a lot of bone, you'll see very uh, bright signal. Uh, you see a this what we call the soft tissues and this gray matter remember i mentioned the cells are on the surface it's a little bit whiter than the white the little bit brighter i should say on ct than what's called the white matter or the axons that are inside the brain so the surface is a little brighter on ct and those cell bodies have mitochondria they have a little bit more blood vessels they have more iron and so the surface of the brain with these convolutions will appear more brighter. Uh, the darkest part in the brain is the fluid inside in the ventricles. So brain MRI, notice that the uh, axons, which are fatty, are brighter than the cell body. So it's kind of like the opposite of CT. Uh, so the fatty axons will have more uh, definition or more brighter on the MRI. Uh, the fat around the bone will have, so the bone itself is pretty dark, but the uh, fat around the bone uh, will have a, a bright uh, signal on the brain MRI. Now we can do contrast uh, with both of these, which will show more things. We're not going to talk about that, but contrast can show more uh, detail. Uh, let's shift from the diagnostic side using ionizing radiation, in particular x-rays and PET, to the therapeutic side. And we're going to talk about radiobiology and radio oncology. So radiation oncology uh, is related to using radiation to kill cancer cells. And the fundamental mechanism of killing cancer cells is based on their unique property of dividing very frequently. Uh, all cells, or most cells, will divide and create daughter cells. We call this mitosis and the cell cycle. But cancer cells are dividing more often and more rapidly than normal cells. So in understanding of radiobiology, it's important to understand the cell life cycle. This life cycle of how the cell uh, is sitting normally, then it gets ready to divide, divides, and then is normal, and then gets to the next phase of dividing again. And we call this the cell life cycle. It's split into two major phases. The mitotic phase, mitosis is the actual separation uh, into two cells, and then the interphase, which is between the mitosis. Uh, cancer cells will have more cells in this mitosis phase, they will have a shorter interphase, uh, relatively shorter. So uh, let's look at this in a little more detail. The mitosis phase has two parts, uh, cytokinesis, mitosis itself, and cytokinesis. Mitosis is the separation of the DNA, and cytokinesis is the separation of the cells. The G1 phase is a normal uh, cell, uh, in its resting state, if you will, in the interface. And then as it approaches mitotic phase, it will undergo an S phase of DNA synthesis. And then a G2 phase of getting ready for the mitosis. 
synthesizing proteins, microtubules, and so forth. So I highlight uh, this S phase here because that DNA synthesis is very important for the action of radiation, ionizing radiation. And that's the topic for the next slide. So the mechanism of tissue damage uh, due to ionizing radiation is largely due to the effect on DNA. Uh, this DNA, uh, if it becomes mutated, uh, that division, the mitotic phase, uh, will be arrested. It won't be able to happen. The DNA won't divide, won't replicate, and so forth. So the cell will stop dividing. And there are two mechanisms by which ionizing radiation creates uh, these mutations. One is what we call direct action, where the photon, the radiation comes in, uh, X-ray, or in some cases gamma rays, but uh, usually X-rays, and it ionizes or breaks an electron off and that will cause a bond to break in the DNA, making it unstable, and the replication process causing a mutation, uh, and also other difficulties with organizing the DNA for the mitosis. The second way is by indirect action, where you have water or oxygen being uh, broken apart into free radicals. Those free radicals, they in turn can cause damage on the DNA, creating new free radicals. It turns out that the more important uh, action is the indirect one. Uh, there are a couple of reasons for that. One is that a lot of the photons will go straight through the DNA uh, or have a little chance of hitting the DNA. So each photon creating a mutation here is not that common. In addition, when the photon comes and makes the mutation, the energy is absorbed, the mutation happens. So the one-time event. But in the indirect action, there's a lot more water and there's a lot more oxygen around. So there's a lot more chance that the photon will create a free radical. And because of the chemistry, as you, some of you may know from organic chemistry, free radical chain reaction, will uh, mechanistically create a new free radical after it causes this damage. In other words, it's not a one-stop or one-shot uh, effect. It can replicate many times. So one photon can potentially create 20 or 30 damaged areas, ionized areas, broken bonds, 20 or 30 of them for a DNA molecule. So the indirect effect is much more critical. The problem with the indirect effect is you need to have oxygen in that region. If you don't have oxygen in that region, you don't really create those oxygen free radicals and you have a much less efficient direct action. So let's talk about how we can optimize the damage to the DNA in the tumor tissues. And we call these the four R's of radiation biology. Those four R's are repair, reoxygenation, redistribution of the cell cycle, and repopulation of the cells. What do these mean? If you uh, cause this radiation damage to the DNA, the body, since radiation is all around us in a low level, uh, we have evolved mechanisms to repair the damage. If that didn't exist, we would die you know, right away, very soon. Uh, we live for 80 years, 90 years, whatever, uh, and uh, a lot of radiation over time, but we have repair mechanisms that fix that. So as you blast the tumor, it will also repair. And that repair process takes time. Now, the other problem is when you blast the tumor, uh, you also kill the blood vessels. You kill uh, the ability for oxygen to come there. So if you blast it and then blast it again right away, there's not enough oxygen. You get don't get as enough effect. And we call that the second R, or reoxygenation. Remember, we had the cell cycle, 
and the cell cycle has the G1, the S phase, the G2, and the M phase, the most susceptible part is during the S phase. So cells are going through this cell cycle. We want to maximize the amount of radiation delivery during the S phase. And we call this the third R, or redistribution within the cell cycle. And finally, of course, new cells grow back, uh, and we call this repopulation of cells, the fourth R. So it looks a little bit complicated, but uh, we want to time the amount of radiation doses, so actually we optimize it. So if we do it too soon, then we don't get enough oxygen there, and we don't get them distributed in the S cycle, right? If we do it too long, then we get too much repair and too much repopulation. The tumor grows back, uh, it's repaired, and uh, it can grow more. So we call this fractionated dose radiation. That's the classic radiation oncology in order to optimize these four parameters. We have two types of radiation being delivered. One is external beam radiation, gamma rays, neutron beams, proton beams, uh, the x-rays that we talked about. The other one is medically delivered radiation, also known as brachytherapy. Uh, which can be radio immunoconjugates, antibody target radiation. So we have an antibody that has a radiation element, radio conjugates, uh, isotope tag to some uh, bone seeking material, free isotopes, iodine, radioactive iodine, or gallia. So external beam radiation and medically di driven radiation. So in this brachytherapy with medically driven, we can have a catheter, it goes through blood vessels, for example, lung cancer. Uh, or it goes into the bronchi, this, this is the lung, this is the bronchi, the catheter goes down, here's a radioactive source, you put it right near the tumor and it creates the radiation in a continuous way, not the fractionated external beam, but the continuous uh, brachytherapy. Uh, many toxic effects to radiotherapy in the cell cycle we talked about, cell cycle arrest. Uh, some cells can survive and you can get a second malignancy. You can break down the skin because the skin has a lot of dividing cells. You break down mucosal barriers in the uh, stomach, in the esophagus, intestine. Uh, you get some chronic inflammation. You get loss of stem cells. So you have a reduced immune system. You can also get atrophy uh, and chronic damage to uh, uh, tissues. So these occur over time, minutes, hours, days, weeks, uh, to years. So radio surgery, we talked about fractionated dose. Radio surgery is a way of having a very high dose uh, that has not DNA damage effects, but essentially direct deterministic uh, effects. You destroy proteins, you destroy cell membranes, you essentially, in a way, radioactively burn the tissue. Uh, you need to do that in one single, single dose because it's a uh, irreversible process. The other problem with that is that you can damage a lot of normal tissues. And so radio surgery, which is uh, using radiation, but in a single step, one step, not fractionated, but in a single step, takes many different beams uh, and focuses them on a target so that the high intensity radiation is not experienced in normal tissues as much. It's experienced at the focal point of many beams. This is also typically used in brain or spinal cord applications because these tissues are relatively fixed in the skull or in the vertebral column. But in the lungs, uh, the stomach, uh, liver cancer, et cetera, where they're moving, uh, and you need that type of precision, this radio surgery is not uh, indicated. So the original quote from Willem uh, Röntgen, all bodies are transparent to this agent for brevity's sake, I shall call them rays, and to distinguish them from this, others from this name, he calls them x-rays, and that's the origin of that term. 
So we have covered uh, the interaction of radiation with biological organisms, parts one, two, and three. Next week, we are going to focus on electromagnetic methods of diagnosis, not just imaging, but other methods of diagnosis, such as the electrocardiogram, the electroencephalogram, the electromyography, and the electroneurogram and other uh, forms of medical diagnosis based on electromagnetic principles. Uh, this is the end of uh, the lecture, and uh, we will uh, 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 open for you know any questions.